Olá, bem-vindos e bem-vindas. Um bom dia a todos. Eu sou a Denise Barbosa e estamos aqui novamente ao vivo para mais um McKinsey Talks. McKinsey Talks já se consolidou como um espaço para conversas ao vivo entre os maiores experts do mundo sobre temas relevantes para a agenda de negócios. Hoje eu estou remota, temos um participante que está na Alemanha, então também está remoto, e dois diretamente ao vivo do estúdio da McKinsey em São Paulo. E nossa sessão de hoje vai ser sobre plataformas de marketplace, os aprendizados e evoluções deste segmento de consumo, e a sessão vai ser em inglês. We have here with us today Tahir Hussein, Senior External Advisor for McKinsey Global on subjects related to market, marketplace platforms and ecosystems. Good morning, Tahir. Good morning from Munich. <laughs> Welcome. Uh, we also have Marina Mansur, Associate Partner of Maquis São Paulo. Good morning, Marina. Bom dia. Bom dia. Good morning to all. And to moderate today's panel, we have Eitor Martins, Senior Partner, Senior Partner and Leader of Maquis Digital for the Region. Good morning, Eitor. Bom dia. Bom dia, Denise. Bom dia. Vale lembrar que vocês de casa também poderão fazer perguntas durante toda a sessão, utilizando o campo que fica à direita da tela, ou se vocês estiverem no celular, fica na parte de baixo. Por favor, contribuam, a participação de vocês é fundamental. Heitor, please feel free to start. Many thanks. Why are we, gonna, are we talking about marketplaces? Hmm? I just want to show, as a background for our discussion, a couple of charts. And it's... Marketplaces are becoming important because e-commerce sales reach 16% of total retail sales in the world. That is an amazing number, especially if you consider that about 10 years ago, this number was practically zero. All sales were physical. And this number is growing at a very, very fast pace. It has grown over 24% over the last five years and it, per year, and it's growing, and our forecasts indicate that this will grow another 16% per year going forward. Hmm? Now, these are e-commerce sales. Well, but when we think about you know, sales that take place in marketplaces, of, of all e-commerce sales, 60% of them are actually taking place in marketplaces. So marketplaces account today for more, than, if you do the math, for more than 10% of total global retail sales. That is an amazing number. Okay, and that highlights the importance uh, of, of, of the marketplaces in this new world. Uh. So, Tahir, many thanks for sharing with us your perspectives on marketplace. You've grown in this space and you are a true expert. So we are very eager to actually get your, your views on this. Uh, and I would start by asking you to actually explain to us exactly what is a marketplace, because there is a lot of confusion. So, you know, can you tell happy us? Happy to do so. Uh, happy to do so. Having spent almost 10 years at Amazon in Germany, China, and the US, so I was part of uh, creating a marketplace. So allow me to use uh, Amazon's view of what a marketplace is. So traditionally, Amazon was a retailer. We called it the 1P model. So where we bought, like any other retailer, we bought items from our partners and we sold them. We set the prices. At some stage, Jeff Bezos and the leadership team said, if we want to grow our customer serving offer, more selection, more convenience, better prices, what vehicle can we find? And out of this one, the marketplace was born, a vehicle which is a platform allowing uh, outsiders, brands, sellers to participate in the ecosystem selling to customers. So over the years, the marketplace was further developed, more services were added, but in a nutshell, it's a place where uh, not only a 1P model exists, but a 3P model coming from sellers outside uh, coexists. Why is it generating so much traction today? Well, if you look at it from the customer perspective, with the marketplace, you can offer much more selection in a more effective way. So for example, you can create millions of items uh, in fashion without having to buy and stock them all yourself. You can offer better prices because the more selection you can offer marketplaces with competing sellers, the prices will go down. So you create for the end customer, a great way to shop better. 
for the second set of customers, the sellers, you create an opportunity to be present with a huge audience without being an established brand yourself. So it's the attraction to the primary customer, the end customer, and a great way to engage with end customers, the sellers, which make Marketplace such an amazingly interesting uh, setup uh, nowadays. Thank you, Tahir. When we think about marketplaces, né, we see Amazon and Alibaba as the main uh, leading players in the world. Né? They are very different. One of them is in China, the other one in, one in the US, but that's the not on the only difference. They actually follow a very different logic. Né? Amazon is very customer centric. Né? And these numbers, I get really amazed with them. 82% of US households today have an Amazon Prime membership. No? And Amazon can actually reach 70% of the US population no? with same day or next day delivery. No? So Amazon has actually built no, a system that is very focused on delivering superior service to customers and actually you know, on creating loyalty with these customers. No? On the other hand, no, if we think about Alibaba, Alibaba actually plays much more to the strengths of the relationship with the, the merchants. No? They were structured in two pillars. You have Tmall, which is kind of a shopping mall, you know, with a small number, a smaller number of sellers, which tend to be larger sellers no? with, you know, with established brands. No? That is Tmall. And you have Taobao, which is more of a C2C and small business platform that has millions of active sellers and has a tremendous monthly traffic of 440 million people actually going through there. Through there. No? Those are very different models. Can you actually explain to us a little bit more of the differences and the strengths of each other? I'm happy to do so. Um, having lived and worked in, in both in the US and, and Germany, uh, strongholds of Amazon and in China. Let me start off by saying, what are some of the different the customer base? Because if you look at the, uh, the US, Germany, established markets, customers were traditionally, they are used to shopping in offline malls as well. They are used to getting uh, deliveries. They're used to uh, having credit cards. Uh, so the convenience factor was really a number one factor uh, that, that uh, you could build your business model. And we come to that. On the other hand, in China, uh, when I arrived there, in, except for the big cities, there were no shopping malls. There was no real uh, offline purchasing available. Plus, there was no real credit card. So you, you, you actually had an opportunity to create your business around a very different value proposition, actually be the mall and become the currency. So before we talk about differences, similarities, uh, there are similarities. So both of them focus on the customers. You're right, um, Taobao almost more a little bit on the seller. Uh, they use processes, tools, and data to scale. And uh, that's very common. On the differences, I would say Amazon, you said that it's very, very transactional. It's very convenience driven. Prime is at the core of the business. Uh, they really uh, tr try to, to grow that part. And they are very good with all the transactions up to the last mile, which they have grown. And we, we may come to later. Now, in China, on the other hand, um, Tmall, Taobao, Alibaba, uh, they really built not only an ecosystem from the seller side with a lot of focus with the two main pillars, Tmall and Taobao, but they also create a wonderful ecosystem with Alipay. And let's just spend there uh, a couple of seconds. With Alipay, you, you, can re you can make payments very convenient. Not only that, you can actually collect much more data than Amazon uh, has. And what Alibaba is super good at is building use cases that go well beyond the pure transaction and helping uh, sellers, helping brands grow their business. The last one, I would say, um, Chinese shoppers, uh, they are glued to their mobile phones. It's, I would call it a mobile only uh, country. And what you see there is that Alibaba has to and is much more aggressive with engaging content with entertainment on the mobile phone. I would say compared to this one, the way that Amazon does its business is still quite boring. It's transactional. China is engaging. Video is, is the rage. You have talk shows, you have influencers selling online. So these are some of the differences stemming from the difference in the consumers and the culture. 
Thank you, Tahir. We're talking a lot about China and the US, but let's see what is happening in Brazil. In Brazil, we are also seeing and living an amazing growth on e-commerce volume. No? And this number is just amazing. Just in 2020, the volume of e-commerce transactions in Brazil grew 66%. Marina, can you talk, tell us a little bit about that? What is going on? Sure. So what we've seen in Brazil, as you mentioned, uh, during COVID, online sales had a huge growth, right? If you see e-commerce sales and overall e-commerce sales, it grew more than 180% during the second semester of 2020. And this is a stellar number. But when we see marketplaces, as Tahir mentioned it, e-commerce has 1P and 3P. And marketplaces were the bulk of this growth. If you consider that Mercado Livre is 100% 3P, and if you add uh, the three P parts of other big marketplaces, such as Magazine Luiza or Via Varejo and others, it gets up to 70% of the total sales volumes in the country. So three P, not only e-commerce is gaining traction in the country with Brazilian consumers, but three P marketplaces are in, in the core of this growth. Of course, all of those players still have to figure out how to gain seller attention and how to attract those sellers to those platforms. But the seller sale, the 3P part of it, it's already up to 70% of the e-commerce penetration in the country. Thank you. Now, with this whole world of 3P and marketplaces are actually getting very crowded. No? And it's getting more and more difficult for actually sellers to differentiate their products and reach the consumers. How is this battle taking place, Tahir? What advice can you actually give to sellers? Yeah, so um, let me start off by saying I would always uh, differentiate, differentiate between brands that also think about whether to engage with the marketplace as a seller and uh, sellers, especially with Amazon, some of the countries that are uh, they are only focusing on selling on, on the marketplace like Amazon, which, by the way, I think will also come a lot more in, uh, in Brazil. So if you look at the seller part, what I've seen, um, they are actually geared to, they focus their whole work on understanding how, for example, Amazon works. Uh, what does it mean? It means you have metrics that are um, Amazon metrics. They are very different from what you have at other retailers. You also are, have requirements in uh, how to compete and how to win. At Amazon, if you don't win the buy box in a smartphone, you basically, uh, you're not visible. How do you win the buy box? Now for Amazon, you saw it uh, in a previous slide that Prime is so key. So you have to be able to offer in some way or the other Prime, either through a program called Fulfillment by Amazon, where you send your items to the uh, Amazon Fulfillment Centers and they send out like any other one they offer, or you have new programs like a new seller fulfilled prime. But you need to understand how Amazon determines what goes into the buy box. Now, for brands that are now growing their own direct to consumer business and are thinking about how to engage in a marketplace, one of the number one lessons I've seen and I've talked to clients is you need to have a different mental model when you talk to Amazon than when you have with your usual retailer. You cannot translate all the metrics and the measures of success. Because if you do that, you will in all likelihood fail. For example, uh, um, sellers tell me that Amazon has all these crazy logistical requirements. They are not reasonable. Well, I just said, that's how Amazon runs the business. It's a very su successful marketplace. So you need to build the capabilities inside, even if you haven't had them, to satisfy these requirements. So you need to be all in before deciding to engage and really be successful with a marketplace like Amazon. Tahir, let me complement that question because what you described is very exciting, but at the same time, very frightening for retailers, no? especially for small retailers. If you think about somebody who had a small shop, it's a whole different dynamics. No? How do you learn how to operate in this, in this new space if you're a small retailer? No? Is, are there, you know, 
there a, a, an educational component taking place? Are there schools, technical programs to create people, uh, to prepare retailers for, yeah. for this new environment? So, you know, we talked about brands and now you talk about retailers. I mean, we see these trends all around the world and, and the COVID has actually accentuated. It is incredibly hard. So the number one thing before we talk about how to engage in the marketplace is what can you as a small retailer offer that a big marketplace cannot? And small retailers, they can sometimes be nimble in offering a better service. Uh, in fashion, you can offer a better service in advising, especially women, what a, what a good uh, match of, of colors looks like in a way that Amazon can't because Amazon is very transactional. So I always tell them, is there something where you can differentiate yourself in countries where Amazon is strong in the way that you, you communicate and your strength towards the end customer? Now let's assume that they say, um, that's all good, but I want to be successful on Amazon. Well, number one is you really want to make sure that you, uh, you have a dedicated team. So don't run it out of your existing teams, have people that are really dedicated to working on Amazon. I've seen retailers and brands that operate the Amazon store as an extension. I can tell you it will fail. So dedicated teams. Second one is you need to give them leeway to experiment. Uh, so if you want to be successful on Amazon, Amazon is a machine that experiments uses data. If you want to be successful, apply that mechanism. So don't expect and don't have a profit expectation in six months. Have a long-term view that uh, how you uh, how you want to engage. I think these are two ingredients that I, that I would give as advice, not only to small retailers, but in particular to small retailers who decide to engage with a marketplace like Amazon. Very interesting. Now we're talking about retailers competing for space in marketplaces, no? but what about the the other aspect? Do marketplaces actually compete for retailers? It's in Brazil, where you know we have this, this, the, comp the competitive scene of marketplaces is not fully established. Are marketplaces competing for the retailers in Brazil? Can you tell us, Marina? Yes, they yeah. are. Oh, sorry. Yeah, they are. So what we see in Brazil is that we are. I think I feel like we are a few years behind of what uh, marketplaces face in the U.S. and China. So our small mom and shops, uh, retailers, our small merchants are still not digitized. So when we see how marketplaces can compete with those sellers, the most important thing is to help those sellers to digitize themselves fully. So you not only offer a platform for them to sell, but you also have to offer other services, financial services, for example, such as credit and payment methods, or non-financial services, such as, such as accounting and legal and, and legal aspects. So you have to think about the seller whole journey to be able to give a, a, a better value proposition than your peers. And you have to remember that those marketplaces are, co are competing for the seller attention with banks that see SMEs and small merchants as a big client, with uh, cooperativas, which have, been, which have been historically a great companion of those guys, and also with payment companies. Payment companies uh, came in around, around 2014 and saw those small sellers as a huge opportunity for them to grow. And all of these four players are trying to tackle the whole journey of this seller. So the competition scenario, it's really stiff in Brazil. So what you're saying is that marketplaces are actually competing you know, for, the, for the sellers in Brazil by offering them, by helping them to transition into the digital economy. Exactly. Did that take place in, in the U.S. and China as well, Tahir? How is that competition for the merchant going on abroad? Yeah, so let me build on, on what Marina said, because I, I give you an example of what's happening over the last few years in, in India, which uh, is not the U.S. and China, but uh, India follows in some of the footsteps of, of China. Is, and you mentioned the financing. It's very important because especially small sellers, when they want to grow the business, if you, for example, in fashion, you want to order stuff that you can sell, you need money and you need to pay the suppliers in advance. So financing and some of these services and really making it tailor-made to the sellers has been and continues to happening. Uh, taking an example of a uh, player in, in Europe that is a, a viable competitor to, to Amazon, which is Salando for fashion. 
what they have done is very similar. They uh, improved the services, the tools, so that sellers, large and small, can help themselves. I would like to mention that uh, one trend that has been happening at the same time is that more and more brands, they are also establishing and growing their direct-to-consumer uh, activities. And what I've seen from many brands is they say, on top of our own uh, efforts, we only want to be on two platforms. Uh, we, we, we don't want to be more, uh, more platforms. So that's why if uh, the competition is also heating up for the marketplace to become one of those one or two destinations for the brands, because the brands themselves are also the growing their direct to consumer efforts. Very interesting. Denise, maybe we have some questions from the audience. We should do. We have a, here uh, a few questions. I'm, I'm going to um, ask two of them, and then we, in, by the end of the session, we do a few more. So uh, I have a few questions here. Uh, Marina, the first is for you. What are the economic models for marketplaces? Do all of them depend on take rates? So the answer is no. So most of them, the, the bulk of the revenue pool is, uh, is it comes from, from take rates. So take rate is the rate that marketplace is charging in every uh, sales volume, right? In Brazil, it's something around from 6 to 12%. But not all of them depend on take rates. What we are seeing around the world, uh, Taobao is an example of it, is that uh, they don't charge any take rate, but they charge for value-added services. So Taobao charges for logistics services, it charges for ads and, and pricing and promotion tools, it charges for CRM analytics. So you provide the seller with a whole, with a whole package of value-added services, and you charge for those, but do not charge for take rate. And I feel like in Brazil, we have a culture of negotiation take rates up until the end of it, but sellers are still willing to pay for all those value-added services because they need them so badly. So I feel there are different uh, economic models, not only take rate is the, is the answer. Okay, Tahir, we have a question also for you. It uh, what are Amazon main competitors in the US? Is this a winner takes all market? Yeah, it's a good, good question. So if you follow especially the events over the last year or so, uh, I would say in most categories, Amazon has really um, grown so fast and ha has been so strong. Now, there are very, very notable exceptions. And one of them is of course food. Uh, if you look at food, where new ecosystem marketplaces are created, you have a big, big giant competitor, which is Walmart, and the competition is is uh, huge. So I would say um, Amazon has a very strong position in many categories, and it's accounting for a bulk of the e-commerce uh, revenues that is that is uh, 60, 70 percent. As a matter of fact, people start their search on any product search on Amazon and not on Google anymore. Uh, but they have a big competitor in, uh, in Walmart in the US and they have in a couple of countries and verticals uh, competitors. It will be harder and harder uh, for other players to enter because these big players, they're building up capabilities and a customer lock-in that is difficult to snatch. Okay, thank you. Back to you, Ito. Thank you. Let's change gears a little bit and talk about logistics. No? I remember when we started actually in this the e-commerce and the marketplace space, one of the key challenges is you would buy, actually buy something and it would take two weeks for the product to arrive at your house. No? And nowadays, you know, most of deliveries are actually made on the same day, next day, you know, and when it takes three days, we already get upset that it's taking too long. No? It's a very different dynamics. Tahir, can you actually tell us, uh, you know, about the the importance of the delivery experience, no? and how are companies actually working to improve that and deliver superior service on that front? Yeah. Um, so one is again, if you look at work from the customer backwards, uh, in the US for many years, one or two day delivery uh, in most cases was absolutely fine. Now, as you had new competitors and new businesses. 
they were actually, um, they could optimize their whole <clears throat> supply chain on these verticals. So Amazon for one, because they wanted to grow in food and you don't want to wait for two days in food. We talked about this. Second, the strong investments of Amazon in logistics up to the last mile, they have also come as a defensive move. Defensive to make sure that no one else can capture it. And the defensive move, one thing you should not underestimate, Amazon realized in most markets that the key players they relied on for many years, United uh, Parcel Service in the US, Royal Mail in the UK, DHL in Germany, they would not be able to handle uh, the scale. So they would, they would have to grow this, this business. Now to two, two hours or one hour that I, for example, many uh, customers around the world can now enjoy with Prime now. One of the key things that Amazon said is, this is crucial, how do we make it happen? If you know how expensive and how long-term it is to build a sustainable and scalable two-hour delivery network, many, many clients and many companies say, I cannot do this. Now, Amazon said, it's how do we make it happen and how do we scale it? And the, the good thing that really Amazon has been doing over and over again, is you have a bold vision. We want to have one or two hour delivery available to 80% of our customers, but we're gonna start with one city. So Prime Now was launched in one city with certain zip codes in Manhattan, and they delivered within one hour using Uber cars, using their own bicycles, et cetera. But they knew that they have to build it. So it's an investment in uh, own process technology, owning more and more parts of the last mile yourself, and making sure it's not just offensive move towards the customers, but you're also protecting your turf with the investments that are very, very difficult to rec recruit for other uh, players to try to enter that space. But so Tahir, just to make sure I understood, if you're living in New York or in London or one of the major urban centers, you now, one hour delivery is nowadays a reality. You can actually shop and get the products to your door in one hour. That is absolutely correct. And if I look back, and I was part of the discussion with also with Jeff Bezos, because we were, I was sitting in China and our competitors in China, they were actually offering that one. And when we, we communicated back at the time in 2010, 11, to Jeff Bezos, he was aware of it, that many of the people said, American customers don't need it. Now, fast forward, they very much need it. And the question is, are you the first one offering it and building it, or are you uh, late to the game? So, uh, for example, we had snow, we have a uh, lockdown still. I ordered on, uh, on Amazon fresh 100 euro order uh, on, uh, um, in the evening at 7.30 and my delivery slot was nine o'clock uh, with everything, fresh food, et cetera. And that is, once you tasted it, it's becoming normal. It's becoming the new bar. You don't want to go back. Uh, so it's that kind of standard raising that has happened and that it's just a question of when it will happen in all geographies. Very interesting. And in that journey, you mentioned actually some players own the infrastructure, others outsource. What are the trade-offs in that decision, owning versus outsourcing the logistics information, the infrastructure? Yeah, so let's talk a little bit about Amazon and let's talk a little bit about also Alibaba because uh, as we said, they have slightly different models. So Amazon, uh, for many years, they owned the, the uh, um, fulfillment centers, they owned the supply chain. They didn't want to own the, the last mile because they said that's a commodity. Um, but for two reasons, they, they have now become more and more entrenched in the last mile. One, as I said, uh, they realized that the, the uh, DHLs of the world couldn't handle it. So they would, uh, for Christmas, they would have to uh, uh, have the cutoff much earlier, which is out of the question. So they had to build it because otherwise the customers wouldn't get it. And the other things, there are now more and more services that can be offered uh, when you actually build out your own last mile. So one is the transparency I get as a customer being delivered from an Amazon vehicle is phenomenal. I can see on my smartphone where the driver is, how far away they calculate, et cetera. So that's all proprietary technology. It would never integrate with a partner like, uh, like DHL. So you can extend the service 
And you can extend it even more. If you look at a, a player like AO in, in UK and, and uh, uh, Germany, what they do is when they deliver your white good, they take your white good with you. So when you have a refrigerator, they take your old one with you, which is wonderful. So building this uh, own network allows you to offer additional services. Alibaba, on the other hand, has traditionally had a very asset light model. So they said, we can make a lot of business by growing our seller base. And we work with Thai now with partners to, to, to drive the logistics uh, um, a network. So Alibaba has actually said, we can get a lot of information out of the, uh, the uh, delivery part that we can use for other parts. So distances, et cetera. So in other words, there's not one size fits all. However, you should decide as, as you engage in becoming and growing as a marketplace players, which part of the customer experience are crucial to your customer experience and where do you actually want to invest as opposed to partner? Thank you. I'm going to propose we actually change, change topics again. We talk a lot about marketplaces as a space where you can buy products from multiple providers, the 3P model. Hmm? But uh, we are also seeing uh, some marketplaces developing their own products, uh, products too, and their own product offering with private label many times. You know, how do you see this trend between 1P and 3P actually living in the same platform? You know, how you, you know, how they interact, and are, is there a conflict of interest, you know, a, a channel conflict, in, you know, when you offer 1P and 3P in the same platform? Yeah, so let's start with the customer again. The first efforts of the Amazon marketplace, by the way, were a total disaster because they were two different experiences. One was a 1P experience and the other one was a 3P experience. So it wasn't one platform. It was only when this concept of the single detail page was born that the marketplace really started to fly. And you talked about the biggest identifier and unifier for, for customers, which is Prime. So from the customer perspective, it doesn't matter when they see Prime, many customers don't see whether it's uh, sold and shipped by Amazon. They see it's Prime, so they have an Amazon experience. So from that perspective, it's, it's, it's really great because you combine the best of the two worlds. Now, you talked about private label. If you see today, Amazon's 1P efforts, the strongest one are private label. Uh, uh, if you see many, many product uh, categories right now, fashion, etc., the first offers will be 1P uh, product. So it's a, it's a good way to drive your own private label product, which by the way, is not an Amazon invention. It's been done for many decades in retailers. When you go to the supermarkets, they have their private label. Now have there been conflicts? I can tell you, we've had plenty of conflicts with Amazon because we had for many years, separate organizations. We had a 1P organization with retail tools and we had a 3P organization with uh, seller tools. And sometimes we would go to the same brands at different times. So the coordination effort internally was quite cumbersome. And sometimes the brands would also complain because they wouldn't have one uh, a single point of contact, which was one of the key reasons why Amazon, after a decade of having those standalone tools, integrated the two teams into one, uh, one organization to address those conflicts. But Amazon, and that's one advice I can say, same for Alibaba is, Conflict is good when it's healthy, when it creates competition. Uh, just having cohesion for the sake of not having conflict sometimes slows down innovation. So Amazon is very, very aware that healthy conflict is good conflict. Very interesting. I mean, I'm gonna turn back to you now. Can we, uh, when we look at Brazil, yeah, we see that many of the obstacles to the delivery of e-commerce, uh, the growth of marketplaces in e-commerce, are actually related to the operations. It's actually the delivery cost, it's the, the, the time that it takes to deliver, it's the trust on the online transaction with the credit card and so on. Uh, so there are, you know, there are infrastructure and cultural elements that are actually, you know, in a sense, limiting the growth of, of e-commerce and marketplaces here. How do you see that scenario evolving over time? Hmm? So uh, there, I feel like there are three main bottlenecks to e-commerce penetration and marketplace penetrations in the country. The first one, Tahir mentioned it really well, which is logistics, right? 
So in Brazil, we still lag a, a good logistics infrastructure. So those players have to either build themselves the logistic network to be able to deliver in two hours, in one hour, or even in same day, because in Brazil, most of the sales still take uh, three days to be delivered in your house. So they either have to build their own or they have to partner up and, and, and find those last mile partners, for example, to be able to deliver that experience to the Brazilian consumer. If that doesn't happen, categories such as fresh foods would not, uh, would not increase penetration in e-commerce because you won't buy fresh food to be delivered three days from now, right? The second important aspect that you mentioned as well is payment method. For a long time, the only payment method in online platforms was credit cards. And not all Brazilians have access to credit card. But right now, we are seeing a lot of shift in the payment industry with PIX coming along and with uh, wallets and QR code and debit card becoming available on online, online platforms. So I feel like that obstacle, it will gradually get out of the way in the next 12 months. And the third aspect I would mention, which is some, somehow related to what you call cultural, is the skept how skeptical the Brazilian consumer is on buying online when it comes to, for example, uh, return of the items that they don't want. In the US, that, was, that, that experience is flawless. You buy something, you don't like it, it's really easy to return it, and in two days you have your money back. In Brazil, we still lag a lot of the, uh, a lot of the items in this, in this channel to have this experience uh, uh, in a much you know, seamless way for the consumer. So once we tackle those three points, I feel like e-commerce and marketplace penetration will increase by a lot in the country. Very interesting. Denise, I think we still have, we're getting close to the end of our session, but do we still have time for a few more questions from the audience? Great, great. We do have questions here. Marina, uh, for you, what are the categories most common on marketplaces and what are the ones that are gaining traction right now? So the most common for marketplaces, and I feel like the U.S. started in the same way, are uh, electronic goods and white goods. Right? So these, these are the categories that are easier for the consumer to browse, to compare, and they feel more secure on buying online. But we are on the verge of a lot of different categories to gain uh, space on online sales. So dry food is one of them. Uh, during COVID, a lot of people are experienced buying their, buying their supermarket, uh, making their supermarket purchase online, and that experience is gaining traction. Uh, and also fashion. So Tahir mentioned that Amazon fashion uh, became a huge thing in the U.S. And I feel like the apparel industry will see a lot of, uh, a lot of, a lot of penetration in online sales and specifically in marketplaces. Yeah, I do like to buy fashion online. <laughs> I do. Uh, Tahir, uh, a question for you. What are the key criteria for deciding whether to launch a marketplace? Yeah, so um, before I answer that directly, I would, I would say based on my experience as a um, senior expert all around the world is it's not 100% necessary that you have to launch a marketplace. I understand Amazon, but it, it's, it can be a super interesting and viable option, but you, you shouldn't follow the marketplace uh, craziness just because you have those big players. Having said that, what are key criteria? Number one is you have to understand who you, who are your customers. So are these end customers? What kind of needs do they have? And then really, what are the one or two criteria that you want to wow your customers? So if one of the one or two criteria is selection, like we just said, a marketplace is an extremely interesting option for you to uh, to grow that business. Uh, if you're uh, if you want to grow further uh, delivery part and you build out these capabilities, but you don't want to do, do all the delivery yourself, again, that is that is uh, a good criteria. So it really depends on who your customer focuses and what are the one or two things you really want to wow your customers on. 
Um, I would say is the the uh, once you decide on, on on those, you need to understand that building a marketplace does not happen overnight. So we talked about uh, building the capabilities, but you also it's it's uh, as Marina also um, talked about. It, there's, there's cultural elements in each market, but there's also cultural elements in building a marketplace. So if you build one, you have a 1P, how do you handle the internal conflict, et cetera? So you need to have a long-term view and commitment that this is the right thing for you to uh, drive sustainable growth for your business five, 10 years from now, not in 12 months. Marina, one more question for you. As a fashion retailer, for example, why would I enter a marketplace versus building my own? That's, that's a great question. So why, I feel like the trade-off, uh, putting in a very simple way, the trade-off is between volume and customer ownership, right? So one reason for you to enter into a big marketplace is volume. These marketplace platforms together, they have more traffic, daily traffic through their platforms than all, all of the shopping malls in Brazil altogether. So if you, wanted to, if you want to increase volume uh, and you want to gain scale, being on a marketplace uh, could be crucial to your brand. On the other hand, being on a, on a marketplace, you lose a little bit of the customer ownership the customer relationship, because the customer is buying on the marketplace and not on your own platform. And I, I, would, change the, I would change the phrase you ask, why should I be on a marketplace or build my own marketplace? And I feel like that for fashion retailers in specific, you, if you're not entering in a marketplace and if you want to compete, you are not only have to build a marketplace, but you're going to have to build an ecosystem. So it's not only providing other 3P uh, products, but you have to think of other services and other experiences that you're going to have to provide to your customer to be able to track all the, all the traffic that those marketplaces platform have to your own platform. Uh, we, are, we are almost running out of time, Carrier, but I'd like to, uh, to ask you one last question. How is Amazon expanding to new countries? Yeah, so um, Amazon has traditionally been quite careful in not expanding to too many countries uh, too quickly, but they have over the years expanded first to more mature marketplaces. Uh, and they, when they enter a market, let's take the example of Brazil. They first enter with what they think is a very solid basic offer. They understand they have a, a strong team on the ground and they understand what are unique requirements for Brazil. So on top of the things that Marina mentioned, my understanding was that there's also some unique tax requirements in, in Brazil that need to be handled to, to grow and build your marketplace. And you need to make sure that you can actually handle this on, uh, on the systems. And I would say the third element is making sure that all the success elements that you've had in the US and other mature uh, countries are there. So if you see what's been happening in Brazil and you will continue to see it as Prime has become more uh, prominent, will continue to be more prominent. It's taken some time uh, to do so, but making sure all the critical elements, not only the categories, not only the infrastructure, but also services like Prime are rolled out and offered in a way that is attractive to local customers. Thank you very much. Denise. Oh, go ahead, Ito. Yeah, I know we're running out of time, but I do have one last question for Tahir. Okay. Tahir, what is going to happen to the traditional retailer? Are, are shops, physical shops, going to disappear? What is the future? What, how does the future look like? Yeah, so I sit in a, in a country like Germany. Germans, by the way, uh, Marina, we, we are very skeptical and we are very tend to be negative on the part. So the, one of the big stories is now, has Amazon eaten us all? So I, I, I keep saying, when you look at traditional retailers in many countries, in the US and Germany, for many decades, what they have done is they kept their model, but they largely uh, kept it unchanged towards the customer. I see retailers that continue to be successful in understanding customer needs and addressing specific areas. I see retailers that offer, take the example of Nordstrom in the US. Uh, Marina talked about it. They offer a, a store which has not thousands of shirts and, and, and colors, but it's a concierge service where you can go in and we, you can get a, a, a advisory. So you need, to, you need to innovate and find ways to drive 
um, to drive relevance with customers. In other ways, there are ways, and I think it's not a one winner takes it all, but you need to apply some of the thinking that players like Amazon or, uh, or Alibaba have, customer focus, innovation, speed, data, to out Amazon your market. So don't be an or, uh, don't be passive, take risks because your legacy business, if you don't change it, will die. Can we finish yes. now, Ito? I think so. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I could okay. stay forever <laughs> here, but, <laughs> but uh, we, yeah. do, <laughs> we do have to close, I guess. <laughs> so yeah, then is it back to you. The conversation is very good. Ok, thank you. So, thank you very much, Tahir. Muito obrigada, Marina e Heitor, pela conversa de hoje. E a todo mundo de casa que mandou perguntas e ficou aqui com a gente os últimos 45 minutos, super obrigada. A próxima sessão, excepcionalmente, vai ser na segunda-feira, dia 22 de fevereiro, ou seja, da outra semana, às 6 da tarde, às 18 horas. Coloca aí na agenda, gente. Colaboração eficaz entre empresas tradicionais e startups para criar valor no longo prazo. Essa sessão vai ser também realizada em inglês. A gente vai ter aqui o Brian Walsh, que é Head da Wind Ventures em São Paulo, e participação do Sid Hunter, que é Associate Partner da McKinsey, também em São Paulo. Então, para você de casa conhecer a agenda completa do McKinsey Talks, vá em mackinstalks.com. Lá vocês também podem assistir aos episódios anteriores e na, se na segunda-feira o episódio de hoje vai estar disponível lá, caso vocês queiram ver novamente. Vocês também encontram as versões em áudio, tá? No Spotify, para quem curte podcast, ouvir é, as sessões enquanto caminha no parque, esse tipo de coisa. Tempo a gente vai ter para caramba agora nos próximos dias, quem folgar, né? Então, muito obrigada pela companhia, um ótimo fim de semana a todos, até a próxima. Tchau. Um abraço a todos.